On Thursday, Israeli forces fired at hundreds of people in Gaza who had gathered to collect essential food aid. The death toll has crossed 110 and over 750 people have been injured at least. Now, this is not the first time Israeli forces have fired at those who have gathered to collect aid. We know that the aid flow to Gaza has been quite less and people are in an extremely difficult situation. The humanitarian crisis has been worsening. But this is by far one of the most brutal incidents of this sort, especially considering the death toll, considering the number of injured. And considering the fact that it was not only army soldiers who were firing, but the reports say that even tanks were present to it, artillery was involved. And this is, there's perhaps no greater example of the brutality of Israel's assault since uh, October 7th. We go to Abdul to talk more about this. Abdul, thanks so much for joining us. We did talk about uh, the massacre in brief, uh, the, in brief yesterday, but could you maybe take us a bit more in detail as to what happened? And we'll talk about the responses and the larger situation after that. Well, Prashant, as we all know, uh, there were hundreds of Palestinians gathered uh, in Gaza City uh, at Nabul City Square waiting for uh, food aid. Of course, uh, as we know, the, the humanitarian situation inside Gaza is quite bad, primarily because of the war Israel has waged against Palestinians. And also because, of course, the, the aid delivery has been disrupted by the Israelis because of the bombings, because of the ground offensive, because of its restrictions imposed on it. So whenever there is uh, some hope of aid coming, a large number of Palestinians gather to collect it. And, and that basically, when they were waiting for it, uh, uh, Israeli forces uh, started firing at them. Uh, later, they claimed they fired because... Uh, there was some kind of chaos. Uh, of course, there are a large number of Palestinians gathered. They were moving here and there. They were desperate to get food and other things. And they, they used this situation to kind of, instead of kind of attempting to uh, create an order, they basically fired at the Palestinians, killing more than 100 uh, Palestinians and wounding around 750 plus people. And uh, uh, there are reports coming that some of the uh, people killed don't only have uh, gun shots, uh, gun wounds, but also they were trampled by the uh, tanks. There were also firing from the drones, which were flying uh, all over the uh, place. And uh, apparently they were also fired from other uh, uh, unknown uh, sources. So uh, uh, this is the situation in which, of course, this all uh, uh, Isra uh, Israelis claim First, they denied that it is because of them uh, that uh, Palestinians have died. But later on, after it was clear uh, that uh, they have been responsible, they uh, admitted that, of course, their soldiers fired uh, at Palestinians, but they claimed that this was fired only after some of the Palestinians apparently started moving towards them. Of course, this uh, allegation has been uh, rejected by a lot of eyewitnesses who claim that this basically happened because Israeli forces basic, uh, use the last gathering to basically target the Palestinians as they have done it before. This is nothing new. Uh, there are uh, other instances in the past, in the last five months of war, where we have seen that how large number of Palestinians gathered at one place, particularly for food and other aid delivery, or for other reasons have been targeted by the Israeli forces, and some of them been killed. But this is the largest number uh, of Palestinians killed at uh, waiting for food aid uh, so far. Right, Abdul, like you said, this is nothing new for uh, Israel. It has happened in the past, but, by, by, but I think the scale is something that has been, that is quite unprecedented. What have been the kind of responses that have uh, emerged from various sections? Well, uh, of course, most of the uh, world has criticized uh, uh, the uh, calling it uh, uh, massacre. Some of the countries, of course, called it massacre. And some of them basically called it war crimes also, of course. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Brazilian uh, president called it uh, another example of how Israel is basically committing war crime after war crime in uh, Gaza. Then, uh, of course, most of the Arab countries in the neighbor have also condemned the killing uh, uh, and call it, uh, uh, of course, uh, part of the genocide which Israel is carrying against the Palestinians. Some of them have also demanded thorough investigation and, uh, of course, accountability for those who were responsible. Uh, the most, uh, 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 of course, that is, again, not shocking, but if you see, U.S. 
of course saying that the, the uh, killing of uh, so many people is sad and so on and so forth but when the algerians presented a, a kind of draft note in the united nations security council uh, basically condemning the uh, violence and calling israel uh, responsible for it us blocked that statement and did not let it go even the us spokesperson have not kind of uh, taken a kind of uh, strong of course they avoided uh, directly uh, uh, alleging israeli forces for the killing uh, and uh, they have tried to uh, kind of uh, kind of some kind of uh, kind of give israel some kind of uh, clean sheet if you see uh, if you want to say it uh then there are also attempts made by for example un has criticized the killing called it condemnable but their their spokesperson as per the reports avoided taking the name of israel so this two kind of responses we see that of course the killing is bad but uh whether they are re ready to name israel uh, that where where it becomes uh, crucial because if you are not taking the name of the culprit which is who is responsible for uh, for the killing of more than 100 people at one uh, beating for humanitarian aid of course basically you are trying to uh, kind of give uh, some kind of indication that all these kind of killings are acceptable uh, in the name of so called uh, security which israel has been cleaning uh, sorry claiming so uh, uh, the responses of course are uh, varied most of the countries have condemned it but us and its allies have and even of course have not have avoided to take a strong stand which is required at the moment uh, to kind of uh, uh, force israel to stop such kind of uh, uh, massacre of palestinians rebel thank you so much for the update doctors in korea have been on strike over the past few days in protest against an increase in medical quotas now we talked about this issue before and this is a complex issue there are many views within the health community in korea itself but the key news point here is that the government has begun cracking down on these doctors in various ways doctors were striking demanding better working conditions as well as any other demands we go to anish to more talk about this Anish thanks so much for joining us we have talked about this issue in the past and there are some nuances which we'll get to in some time but the immediate news is that the government is cracking down on the protesting doctors so maybe could you start by telling us a bit about that yes so uh, the fact that uh, most of the doctors pretty much uh, like a, uh, apart from a couple of hundred of the 9000 or so doctors have not returned to work uh, and they have uh, essentially uh, held back against uh, the government's deadline uh for the return to work orders to come uh, into effect which was yesterday now uh this uh, they have been ra they have been raiding uh, offices of the KMA the Korean Medical Association uh both in Seoul and uh, other parts of the country uh they have uh, you know seized uh, electronic devices of the doctors there uh the organizers are being uh, held uh and detained uh for actually for instigating that uh, some of the charges include like they have instigated the doctors to strike and uh you know uh, for the mass walkout uh that is pr still in effect so the whole point uh is pretty much uh to intimidate the striking doctors there is nothing new uh the yoon government ha has been guilty of doing this uh for any kind of labor mobilization under his administration uh we have seen uh construction workers uh, movements and other unions being uh, targeted uh by the un administration over various uh under various pretenses uh, including uh, in, in some cases of uh, you know aiding the enemy which is north korea in this case so there has been uh you know, targeting of uh, workers unions workers movements trade unions and this is nothing new in that regard nevertheless uh, most doctors have held on to it uh, as of now there has been no announcement uh, and most of them uh, are in favor of continuing the strike uh, which have uh, you know some uh, several sets of demands that the government right now is not ready to negotiate or even uh, have any kind of talks with uh, at the current moment Right, Anish. But also in this context, would you tell us a bit about the demands, especially considering that even in the health community there are some divisions about it? Yes. So some uh, like the most important and immediate demand, and the reason why the strike has happened is primarily uh, the steep hike in uh, doctors' admissions. Uh, uh, they have increased the number by two thousand seats. 
for the upcoming year, uh, which uh, on top of the 3,000 and so seats, it's a, it's a massive uh, hike and basically two thirds more than what they have already. Uh, the doctors are arguing that, uh, at least the KMA are arguing that uh, the, uh, the hike uh, in the number of seats for medical admissions would actually put a strain on the existing infrastructure, which is not up to the mark. Uh, all, but there are definitely uh, differences uh, because multiple health movements and health organizations are, uh, you know, of the opinion that there is severe uh, medical uh, workers and, uh, you know, doctor shortage in South Korea. We have talked about that in our previous show as well. South Korea has the, the lowest uh, doctor to patient, uh, doctor to civilian ratio uh, on in real terms if you take out all the traditional medicine practitioners and other pa paramedical uh, group uh, professionals uh, the actual number of medical doctors and the ratio that it brings down to 2 per 100 uh, per 1000 and that's a, that's a very massive massively low uh, proportion and that clearly shows this kind of shortage and it's even worse in some of the most essential sectors like uh, gynecology uh, pediatrics uh, and uh, you know uh, elderly care in many of these doctors are limited especially if in the physician uh, like physicians are obviously a larger group because it's a it's it's a profession that actually uh, brings you greater returns and greater income uh, so there are other demands that the kma and other uh, medical uh, health organizations have also brought out, which is the fact that there needs to be better in investments. The infrastructure needs to be, uh, you know, brought out. Like simply and cosmetically increasing the number of doctors will not help the the already, you know, crisis-ridden health infrastructure. It was seen the severity of this shortage was seen during the pandemic, but uh, it was also seen that outside of Seoul, uh, pretty much and its uh, larger uh, surrounding metropolitan area. The health infrastructure in South Korea is quite lacking, especially in you know the far off uh, rural outbacks, and that uh, the, those areas, many of them have hospitals without any proper doctors even, and this is something that needs to be uh, that, that requires a more comprehensive plan than the government right now wants to do. They are actually more uh, concerned of preserving the existing market-based model which pretty much uh, has created this sort of very uneven shortage among the professions, among specialties even. And it has, like, you have more an over, uh, you know, surplus number of doctors in cosmetics and, uh, uh, you know, allied uh, fields, disciplines, and not enough for pediatrics. That clearly shows there is a big, big problem. And the market-based model is not working because uh, obviously doctors are anybody, any new incoming doctors would prefer to opt for professions and specialties that actually give them better returns. And on top of that, infrastructure, as I said, needs to be uh, chalked out. And this is something that pretty much all of the unions agree on. But it's the matter of, you know, quotas, because obviously a large number of these doctors who are uh, striking are physicians. And for them in their sector, it is, uh, you know, it is not necessary to have more doctors. And this is kind of their perspective, which is not something that is uh, shared by most others. Nevertheless, there's a larger systemic problem that is being underdressed right now by the UN government. Right, Anish, in this context, any uh, sug suggestions or signs from the doctors as to what their future course of action will be? Right now, holding on to the strike is something that we're seeing. Uh, uh, the previous, like right before the government uh, imposed deadline of return to work orders to be implemented, uh, there was some talks between the unions and including junior doctors about whether or not they want to return to work after you know the end of February, but that did not happen either. Most of them uh, refused to do that. Nevertheless, uh, you know the continuing the strike might have significantly bigger legal implications, and we need to wait and see if the trade uh, if the doctors' unions are uh, you know ready to take on that sort of you know political repression in many ways. Um, we also need to wait and see if how because there is general uh, you know public disenchantment because there is a crisis uh, because of lack of doctors. Uh, but we also need uh, but we need to wait and see if other unions are going to pitch in in the matter if they are going to pitch into the negotiations that may or may not happen. We are still not sure. 
the government is pretty much on a very uh, belligerent mode at this point in time where it does not want to have any talks with any unions. It's not just doctors' unions. It's pretty much any unions, so and they do not want negotiations at all. So that is pretty much the situation that most of these doctors, striking doctors, have, you know, have to work under right now. Thank you so much, Anish, for that update. And that's all we have time for in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.